This is Winchester Academy. So let's give a warm WAPAC a welcome to Brett Parker. First of all, uh, is, do I have this, is this working okay? Can you hear me all right? Okay, good. All right. Well, um, first of all, I want to say that I was humbled and, and very uh, pleased when I was asked to come to be part of the Summer All-Star Series. Uh, as some recognition of that, uh, I, if you didn't notice, I, uh, I'm, I'm working wounded this evening, but I felt, managed to fall down and break my hand this summer. But uh, I told Ann, I will get over to WAPAC and I'm happy to do this. Um, but uh, yeah, so if I have to move things around a little bit tonight and keep things, just be patient with me, we'll get through it all. And now they've lowered expectations a little bit, let's, let's go ahead and get started. Um, all right, so I'm glad to speak about a topic today that is very important in the state's history, but frankly it's one that's not well known. Uh, 150 years ago, plus a little, in 1853 that is, a group of determined Wisconsin citizens decided that capital punishment was wrong and that they should be the ones to end it in their state. As I said, they accomplished this in 1853, and the story of how and why they did it is one worth telling for two reasons. First of all, it tells us a lot about early Wisconsin and about early America, but secondly, it is a story that has a surprising number of twists and turns. Uh, tonight's story is going to include a frontier shooting, Charles Dickens, a madman who drowned his wife in his own backyard, the inventor of the typewriter, and a humble farmer from Waukesha County who thought he could make the world a better place. This story can also tell us a lot about 19th century America's religion, reform culture, and a frontier state, and that's what Wisconsin was in 1853, a frontier state's desperate attempt to be considered more civilized by the rest of the United States. And to begin, we need to imagine a very different Wisconsin, a brand new state, one that would only become a state in 1848, and one with an 1850 population of 300,000, and a state capital that contained barely 1,500 souls. Um, in some ways, here's a view from 1855, uh, looking from the south shore of Lake Monona across to the capital, as you can see, at that point, Madison not even filled up the isthmus. This is a very small place. It's a very different place from what we see today. To give you some idea of just how new Wisconsin was, the railroad would not arrive in Madison until 1854, the year after the events I'm going to talk about tonight. So we also need to try to recapture the world view of Wisconsinites living in the 1850s. And by that I mean, we need to remember that they did not know how the movie was going to turn out. We inevitably do. We know the way the subsequent history unfolded, but they did not. So this is in no way a story of the Civil War. I am by training a Civil War historian. They did not know that a Civil War was looming. They believed they lived in a world of infinite promise, a world of great change, and if anything, a postbellum world with the, uh, the, the Mexican War just ending a few years earlier. So, the first half of the 19th century, how would people living then really have described it to us if we could ask them today? They would have mentioned that although all periods in history are filled with change, that is particularly true of the early 19th century. It was a time with transportation revolutions, with market revolutions, with a growing and dynamic economy in the United States, one at the same time occasionally had desperate depressions as the economy grew too fast and then sputtered but then quickly rebounded. But it was a time of phenomenal economic growth. At the same time, it was a time in which Jacksonian democracy was flourishing. That is, which the United States, at least for those white men who could vote, was becoming a true democracy. And not only one in theory, but in practice. It's hard to imagine today, but this was a time in which amongst the eligible electorate, and granted that's less than half the population, but amongst those who could vote, regularly 
turnout at elections were over 90%. I don't know what we'd have to do today to make 90% of the people show up. Would we, could we pay you? I don't know. But anyway, but um, it was a time which 90, 95% people showed off at off, off year elections, let alone presidential elections. And so it was a time of dynamic politics and economics. And yet, in some ways, I think many of those Wisconsinites, were we to somehow magically make them reappear here tonight, would tell you that one of the most profound things that had influenced their lives in the previous decades was a series of religious revivals that swept through the United States and through American Protestantism in the early 1800s called the Second Great Awakening. Um, this was a, as I said, a series of revivals. Many of them in their early form took place in outdoor meetings. I'm always fascinated. This was this was painted at the time um, in this in this uh, well, actually, it's woodcut, but based on a painting, you can see that they don't quite know how to handle outdoor things. So they more or less built a room for the preacher to preach in, and then he's speaking to the crowd. And it was a time of uh, evangelical Protestantism where folks were literally falling down seeking conversion, but people would get what was called the jerks. They would begin to jerk as they heard the word, and they would be converted. People were coming to the church in massive numbers. Methodists and Baptists were the ones most active in this movement. And because of the Second Great Awakening of the early 1800s, they would remain by far the largest Protestant denominations in the United States for the next century and a half. That's how profound this group of revivals was on American society. And as I mentioned, its early form was often characterized by these outside revivals that would sometimes go on for weeks. That's where it started around 1800. And I have a map that kind of shows this. Uh, many of the early revivals were in uh, Kentucky, particularly Cane Ridge, which you can see in northern Kentucky. Uh, there are some estimates that the number of people who showed up at Cane Ridge for the revivals in 1801 exceeded the population of Kentucky in the 1800 census. And if you consider how difficult travel was in those days, that is a phenomenal statement about the number of people who are coming to the church, coming to these revivals, and being deeply influenced by it. Particularly, it seems, people who didn't have much power in society were particularly responding to the message. Women, slaves, free blacks were coming to the church in larger percentages even than white men. And partly I think that was because the message of the Second Great Awakening was one of free will. In the Second Great Awakening, free will became the dominant theology of American Protestantism. That is that you made the personal decision whether or not to accept salvation. It finally and completely replace the old puritanical notion of predestination where God decided before you were born whether you were going to heaven or hell and nothing you did could change that. Now it was your decision. And I think many people, particularly those without an all out of power in society, felt empowered by that. This was one element of their life that they could control. Now eventually, the, the, uh, the revival spread to the east and particularly the area that in this map is referred to as the burned over district along the Erie Canal. There were not fires along the burned over district. It was, that's the metaphor for religion. The revival swept up and down the Erie Canal so many times that they were literally burned over. If you think of the, the idea of the Holy Spirit as fire and that sort of that metaphor, that's what they meant by the burned over district. In some ways, the height of the Second Great Awakening came in the great revivals in Rochester, New York, along the Erie Canal in 1831 and 1832, led by a man named Charles Grandison Finney. He was a man who had a certitude that it was his vision to spread the gospel and to bring the Great Awakening to the rest of America. And as if you needed any proof, I thought I would include a photograph. I would not want to cross him. That's, that's my conclusion. He does look like he could stare you through a brick wall, right? I mean, he really does. And he gave fiery sermons that brought many people to the church. And his revivals in Rochester in 1831-32 were in some ways the height of the Second Great Awakening. 
American Protestantism was profoundly influenced by this Great Awakening, even more than the first Great Awakening, which would occur just before the American Revolution. This one, in some ways, was even more widespread and more profound. And the reason it's important to our story tonight is because of what it told Americans, particularly Northerners, that they should do. Now that they had been saved, it was now their purpose to go forth and perfect their society. They believed in the doctrine of perfectionism. They believed that society could be perfected through the efforts of all its members. Now, sometimes at this point, when I'm talking about secondary awakening in class, students get a very um, sort of amused look on their face. And I say, tell me what you're thinking. And they're like, that's adorable. That, that you could believe you could perfect your society. And I said, I understand. We live in a world that they did not know. We live in a world where we know about the wars of the 20th century, of nuclear weapons, of the Holocaust, of AIDS. We know of many things. And we have more of a view of progress that if we can take two steps forward and only have one step back, we're getting somewhere, right? That if we can leave the world a better place than we found it, that is progress. These people did not see those limits. And so with the fervor of the Second Great Awakening, they went forth and tried to diagnose what was wrong with American society, particularly in the North. The South, this didn't happen as much, partly because they were scared to death. As somebody might say slavery was what was wrong with Southern society, and that was not permitted. But in the North, there's very much what comes to be called a reform culture. People join reform movements, the most famous of which in my survey class, I don't have time to cover every reform movement, so I cover what I consider to be the most profound ones. The, the, probably the most successful and the one that had the most adherence was temperance. Many people looked at American society and said demon rum was what was destroying the United States. They had some reason for thinking this. For a, a lot of reasons that I can't go into right now, Americans were drinking a huge amount of alcohol, probably three to four times what we do today. It was cheap, it was safe, it was everywhere. People drank, compared to milk, which is not safe, Abraham Lincoln's mother died of the milk sickness. You're, if your cows get in the snake root, you can die. Water is not safe to drink. Soda has not been invented. In some ways, compared to the other ones, it's not terrible for you, right? The problem is if you take that then as a prescription to go forth and drink whiskey, you probably got the wrong message, right? Uh, but regularly, juries went off to deliberate with a jug of whiskey. Uh, there was a rum pot in the middle of the table at the, at the workshop that everyone was allowed to let Monday afternoon go a little more quickly. Right? It was a different culture. And so Americans said, this is hurting us, and temperance is a tremendous movement to curb alcohol consumption. Indeed, in about 20 years, Americans began to drink half what they had before. And it was mostly because they were persuaded to do so, not through laws, not through any sort of, but just because they made a moral argument that would be better if they did. Because if you stop drinking, instead of having cases of, as you can see here, DT, cholera, collapse, murder, epilepsy, and fever leaving the distillery, we could have the temperate tree of life, which has industry, contentment, humility, sobriety. These are the sort of things that were passed around through American society. And it did have an important influence. Many Americans joined the temperance movement and tried to reduce the amount of alcohol and its destructive effects on American society. Another movement of the period was the early women's rights movement, uh, leading, culminating at Seneca Falls, New York in 1848 in the first uh, women's con rights convention in the United States. It's interesting to contemplate that um, at that convention, 1848, they asked for many things, including the vote, but they knew they wouldn't get it. And that Seneca Falls is exactly halfway between, 72 years before Seneca Falls was 1776, the Declaration of Independence, 72 years later was 1920, the 19th Amendment, giving women the vote around the United States. But they were saying, this would be a better society if women played a greater political role in it and a greater social role in it. Although it was rarer, 
more and more Northerners were becoming at least mildly anti-slavery. That is, believing that in a perfect world, slavery would not exist. Northerners were not becoming crazed abolitionists, saying it should be gotten rid of today, but they began to see that its spread was evil, and they hoped that someday it could be curbed. The most radical of them, the abolitionists were fighting for, it's getting, getting rid of it entirely, it was probably less than 5% of the northern population, however. But some Americans looked around, some northerners looked around and said slavery is what's wrong with American society. By the way, these are not mutually exclusive. Many northerners were going to a temperance meeting on Monday night, to a women's rights meeting on Tuesday night, to an anti-slavery meeting on Wednesday night. They're often involved in these. Fourth one I might mention is public education. The idea that in a republic people need to be educated and public education should be free and available to everyone. And that person on the right is Horace Mann, who is the person most associated with that movement. And it is very successful in the North. By 1860, every Northern state has a free public school system. No Southern states have a free public school system. Again, this is largely a Northern initiative. And finally, there were those who argued for more humane prisons and asylums. That's Dorothea Dix. She argued that the way Americans have been, treated, been treating the mentally ill was unconscionable. They'd been warehousing them. They didn't know what to do with them, so they simply threw them in a warehouse. They were an embarrassment to their families, and she said, no, that's wrong. Every person who is mentally ill, even if we can't do anything for them, even if we don't have treatment, even if we don't have medication, there's somebody's mother, there's somebody's son, there's somebody's daughter. We need to treat them humanely. We need to protect them from themselves and from others and at least create a safe environment. Prison reform advocates said that prison should both reform the person as well as punish them, that they should come out rehabilitated so they had a chance at life. Those are the five I have time talking about in, and they're the five probably most important in antebellum America. Oh, see, there I went and did it. I called it America before the Civil War, right? In the decades leading up to the Civil War. But they weren't the only ones. And the one I would really like to talk about tonight in greater detail is some folks in Wisconsin said the world would be a better place if we didn't have a death penalty. And one of the leaders of that movement was a man named Christopher Latham Scholes. If you've ever heard of him, you probably know him because he invented the typewriter. At least what we now think of as the modern typewriter. Um, here's a curious uh, thing that makes me feel old and I'm gonna now inflict the same upon you. Um, when I teach Wisconsin history, my students could not be less impressed by someone who invented the typewriter, <laughs> a machine that they have never used. <laughs> Many of them have never used a typewriter. Indeed, I will tell story. Until a few years ago, we still had an electric typewriter in our office. If you remember early on, um, computers didn't handle forms too well. They were tough, you know. So we had one for forms. And a student worker was using this electric typewriter, state-of-the-art, IBM Selectrics, you know, would have been once upon a time, right, you know, using this typewriter, and she's typing in the form, and all of a sudden goes, ding, and she jumped back a foot and said, I've broken it. <laughs> and I said, no, you haven't. You actually have to hit the carriage return button. You have to start a new line. And I said, once upon a time, there was just a lever up there. You had to grab and do it yourself. Um, so, inventor of the typewriter, oh, yawn, right? But when I tell them he invented the QWERTY keyboard, right, Q-W-E-R-T-Y, that they use every day and is on every device they own, their smartphones, their TVs, right, their computers, that impresses them. And, you know, maybe that is what he should be known for now, right? Because that is a part of our everyday lives in a way that previous generations would have recognized that silly old machine called the typewriter. So anyway, he is often more known for, the, as the inventor of the typewriter, but he was also deeply interested in abolishing the death penalty. He had been one of those people who called for the reform of prisons, he had been instrumental in getting Waupon built in 1851, the prison at Waupon, 
which had discipline, but, but also had meditation and rehabilitation in an effort to reform and um, keep inmates from committing new crimes. And he was also the editor of the newspaper, the Kenosha Telegraph. And that played a key role in the part he's going to play in our story tonight, because that's where the murder is going to happen that's going to result in the last execution in Wisconsin history. For the record, when Wisconsin had been part of the Michigan Territory, four people had been executed in Wisconsin, what's now Wisconsin, part of Michigan Territory at the time, between 1832 and 1834. Three more in 1837, 1838, when it was Wisconsin Territory. But none had been executed in the, in the territory and now the state of Wisconsin since 1838. And then in July 1850, an unspeakable and despicable murder occurred in Kenosha, just a few blocks away from where Christopher Latham Scholes lived. A man named John McCaffrey, who had been known to have many fights with his wife, one dark night in July of that year, Neighbors heard her screaming, and when they went to see what had happened, they found McCaffrey coming out of his backyard and stepping out of his well. And they said, what are you doing? And he said, I was just getting some water. They looked and found the lifeless body of his wife, Bridget, stuffed down the well. He drowned her with his own hands in his own backyard. And he was very quickly um, charged and convicted of the brutal murder of his wife, Bridget. He was sentenced to hang on August 21st, 1851. And even though Christopher Latham Scholes admitted that it had been a brutal murder, he was still disturbed by what he witnessed as part of that execution. He wrote in the Kenosha Telegraph, carriages and teams from the country came flocking into the city to witness the execution. And he felt that McCaffrey had done all he could to show that he was penitent for his crime. He had confessed to the murder, he had prayed with a priest, and he had waited there and had the noose put around his neck at 12.55 p.m. But the court order said that the execution was to occur at 1 o'clock. So while two to 3,000 people watched, he stood with a noose around his neck waiting for death to come. Which... Scholes thought was grisly, and yet it would get worse. Without warning, at one o'clock, when the door op trap door opened, the hangman had not done his job correctly, and sh and and McCaffrey was not killed. His neck was not broken by the fall. He struggled for five minutes. Doctors continued to find a pulse for eighteen minutes, and therefore would not allow him to be cut down. And again, two to three thousand people watched this spectacle as this man twitched at the end of the rope. Scholes wrote in the Telegraph, the last agony is over. The crowd has been indulged in its insane passion for the sight of a judicially murdered man. McCaffrey murdered his wife without the sanction of the law, and McCaffrey has been murdered according to law. We do not complain that the law has been enforced. We complain that the law exists. Let another system of punishment be adopted and other means used to reform the criminal since the taking the life of the murder is not sufficient to deter the crime. He believed so strongly that what he had seen was wrong that Scholes ran for the state assembly and was elected in 1851, that year of McCaffrey's hanging. He introduced a bill to abolish the death penalty, gave a 90-minute impassioned speech, and the bill failed 36 to 25. So in 1851, he failed in his attempt but he did not give up. And in the next session of the Wisconsin legislature, he found new allies. Edward Lees of Waukesha joined him in the assembly, and perhaps most importantly, Marvin Bovee, a Waukesha farmer, joined him in the Senate in calling for the end of capital punishment in the state. Bovee had been raised and influenced by Quakers and Unitarians, and he was single-mindedly for the abolition of the death penalty. And while Scholes made a series of moral arguments, 
More specifically, Bovey's arguments were all Christian at their heart. Um, he wrote an editorial in his home newspaper in Waukesha. The death penalty, capital punishment, he said, is a dark spot resting on us as Christians. A life once taken can never be recovered, but liberty can be given and restoration made to an unfortunate being who has been unjustly imprisoned. So, let me catch up on the slides here. There we go. Okay. Um, all right. And so now, Scholes was not alone. With Lees and Bovey to support him, this time Lees introduced an assembly bill. Assembly Bill 67A uh, reported and, and, and introduced in January of 1853. And I'm going to read you a little bit about the report. So, they had this set up well. Uh, Lees was on the committee that the bill was referred to and then wrote the report back in favor of the bill. And so they've, they've got a little more uh, a little more a political savvy and they figured out how this is going to work. And so he says, in giving the subject a, a careful and candid investigation, your committee is fully convinced that the taking of life by the process of law is not only inexpedient and unproductive of good results, but is at variance with the principles of a pure Christianity. The experience of the past has fully proved that the severity of punishment has not lessened the commission of crime. Again, it doesn't, in his view, doesn't deter crime. But on the contrary, the establishment of the most rigorous penalties has been accompanied by a corresponding increase of that crime. That there is in our community an increasing care and tenderness for human life. The public sentiment is such that the taking of life by authority of law is regarded as a barbarous cruelty and more befitting the darkened pages of the past than the age of which intellect, virtue, and refinement are its characteristics. Believing that crime would be decreased and the certainty of conviction more fully attained by the repeal of the death penalty, your committee would report in favor of the bill. Now, on first reading, I want to go back to one thing I read there. The claim that capital punishment was, quote, more befitting the darkened pages of the past than the age of which intellect, virtue, and refinement are the characteristics would probably, to many of you, seem like hearkening back to an earlier time comparing a modern, enlightened American democracy of the day and the rule of law to its ancient counterpart of European despots, arbitrary justice, and pre-enlightenment politics. And that is probably partly what he's saying there. But he is also, I think, talking about Wisconsin as a frontier, dogged in its early years by a notorious incident made famous by an influential, widely read person, perhaps one of the most famous writers of the 19th century in the English-speaking world, Charles Dickens. Because Dickens had had a lot to say about this frontier uh, territory at the time of Wisconsin. When Dickens toured the United States in 1842, and here's where he went, came nowhere near Wisconsin, okay, but toured the United States, he had been hopeful that he would see the shining democracy he had so much hope in. But he also saw a lot of what he saw as incivility and violence. And among the many newspaper clippings he included as evidence of the unrefined and violent character of the young American Republic, right up front, was a story of violence from the territory of Wisconsin. Because on February 11, 1842, James Vineyard, a member of the Territorial Council, had shot fellow member Charles C.P. Arndt dead on the floor of Wisconsin's Territorial Council chamber. Dickens reprinted the gruesome details of the crime at length. How Vineyard had called Arndt a liar, Arndt had attempted to strike Vineyard, whereupon Vineyard had stood back, pulled a pistol from his belt, and shot Arndt dead at point-blank range. Dickens noted with derision both the fact that Vineyard had been released on bail and that many had supported his action as a defense of his personal honor. After all, he'd been called a liar. But most disturbing to Dickens was the fact that these rough Western men, which is how he saw Wisconsin in 1841, had defiled the hallowed space of a legislative chamber with violence and killing. His inclusion of the incident in American Notes, 
which you can read free online, by the way, at the Gutenberg Project. You can read the, his account, which comes from a newspaper. Gave it a wider circulation than it would ever have had had it just simply traveled in newspapers at the upper Midwest. And cemented it as one of the stories most associated with early Wisconsin. It had given Amer uh, Wisconsin a bad reputation as a lawless frontier society at odds with American values. And in 1853, the shooting of Arndt had laid only 11 years in the past, and Lees may well have suggested that the abolition of the death penalty might be one small step on the road to a more civilized society and, 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 and somewhat helping the reputation of this fledgling Badger State. By the way, just kind of a side note, uh, one of the things that interests me, first of all, uh, the Centennial Mural, which is in the State Historical Society building in Madison, and I think you can see it pretty well. It's a terribly difficult thing to get a good photograph of, but this was painted uh, in, in, in 19, in, right, well, it was meant to be in 1936, but they didn't quite make it. I think it was painted about 1940. It has many of the great moments in Wisconsin history. There's Fighting Bob LaFollette over here on the left. Um, here is, there's Christopher Latham Scholes with his typewriter. There's the early miners, right? Uh, you know, there's the early history of the state. You can see Joliet, Marquette, the whole thing there. But there is Vineyard Shooting Arndt, the lower left, right? And so if you, if we, if I, let's, I don't know how good the resolution is going to be here, but if we zoom in, there it is. So that's one of the things that is a part of our history still, part of the state's history. And maybe partly what, you know, Bovee and others were trying to work against. Incidentally, Wisconsin, as you may know, the Historical Society is two years older than the state. We have collected everything forever. So indeed, in the collections of the State Historical Society, that is the vest Arndt was wearing, and there's the bullet hole that killed him. Now, I love the fact that we live in a state where we've been collecting things in our history for 150 plus years, and we have a tremendous good collection. Um, I ran across something a few years ago, and I still don't know what to make of it, and I don't even know how to interpret it for you today. I'm just going to tell you what I think when I see it, and then you can make your own judgment. This is a photograph that appeared in the Wisconsin State Journal in 1944. That is a young lady wearing the art vest and another young lady pointing at the bullet hole. Uh, and here is the caption that ran in the newspaper. Model and admire the vest of Charles C.P. Arndt. And Arndt was shot through the chest by James Vineyard as debated on the floor of the Wisconsin State Legislature in 1842. Uh, um, you know, every time I think that the press is, you know, maybe we should lighten up sometimes because this is 1944 and this is the state of journalism. The thing that shocks me the most about this photograph and it running, this ran in the Wisconsin State Journal in July 21st, 1944. That is six weeks after D-Day. Where is the sensitivity of the photographer and the editor who thought that would be an appropriate thing to show in the newspaper? Again, I don't even know quite what to make of that, though I'm sort of glad I found it. Anyway, um, it's, it's remarkable. So apparently in the 1940s, they were getting the old art vest out and having young models admire it. OK, all right, well, that's a strange, but this is maybe a sign of just how deeply that story is embedded in Wisconsin's history. The fact that it shows up on the mural would occasionally show up in a newspaper a hundred years later. Uh, by the way, one last thing in, his, in, the, in the report of the committee that I think is worth noting is they mention that the certainty of conviction will go up if the death penalty is abolished. So they're also making the argument some jurors may be hesitant to convict knowing that the person will be executed because there's no taking it back if it's found later they're mistaken. Whereas if you know, well, we can put them away, and then if later it's, you can change your mind, maybe that will increase the conviction rate. 
Eh, that's an interesting argument. I'm not sure if that would, is actually the way it would work or not, but uh, they thought so in 1853. The bill was reported to the Assembly, and on March 9, 1853, it passed 36 to 28 with 18 abstentions. What's interesting is a lot of, according to those who supported the bill, a lot of those 18 men who didn't vote didn't really want to put, they, they supported the bill, but they didn't want to put their names on it either. They wanted to abstain. So when they knew that the bill would pass without their vote, they decided to be absent that day, to just not, you know, to abstain or to not, to not vote at all. Um, then it went to the Senate. And what's most interesting to me about the Senate is that once it got to the Senate, Bovee really had an opportunity to write a clear rationale for what he wanted to do and why he wanted to do it. And I want to spend a little time talking about that 1853 report. By the way, I have a copy here. It's available online from the Historical Society if you want to download it and read it for yourself. It's about six pages, I think. Uh, but anyway, again, because we obsessively collect everything, uh, 500 copies of this were printed, and uh, a few of them found their way eventually into the State Historical Society's collections. Okay, so what arguments does he make? Because in some ways, this is the fullest argument of those men who came together in 1853 to get rid of the death penalty. Their very first argument was a biblical one. And they said quite clearly, people of Christians on both sides of this issue have quoted the Bible. But we, what we've noted in those debates is that those in favor of the death penalty overwhelmingly quote the Old Testament, an eye for an eye, etc. And those of us who wish to get rid of the death penalty overwhelmingly quote the New Testament, that it is the love thy neighbor as thyself, that is the message of mercy of Jesus Christ, that we are basing our arguments on. So they're saying, yes, we understand there's a biblical argument on both sides, as there are in many issues, but we think in some ways the more... Um, truly Christian uh, version would look at the New Testament and find inspiration there in for the abolition of the death penalty. Secondly, they made something we still hear today, that juries are fallible, that they make mistakes. Remember, too, that this was a time in which there were not even fingerprints had been developed as a technique of evidence, right? Let alone DNA. They didn't know what DNA was, but even fingerprinting would only come in the late 19th century. And so the argument was mistakes could be made. But then they went on and made even further and somewhat more theoretical arguments that are interesting to think about whether you end up agreeing with them or not. Um, the third argument they made was that the taking of life is always wrong. I'll quote the report. That if the commission of the crime of murder by individual man is a sin, the perpetration of the same act by society cannot be called a virtue. Again, sin. Again, very much all of this is embedded in Christian rhetoric. Then it went on to offer a really long and elaborate case, and it's one that's very interesting, but one that's a little hard to fully explain. Maybe it's because I don't fully understand, or maybe I don't fully grasp what their meaning was, but it goes something like this. Government is a compact in which individuals give only those powers to the government deemed necessary for the common good of all. For instance, individuals might agree to be taxed for the common good. Or, in the same way, two individuals might enter into a contract that involves a sale, involves exchange of money, and that would be considered legal too on the same terms. But, can two individuals form a compact that allows one to murder the other? That is, can an individual delegate to another complete control over his life? Does one person have the power to do such a thing? So can I give you the right to murder me as two individuals engaged in a contract? And of course their answer would be no, that only God controls life. That's the argument they're making. So again, to quote the report, in short, does man possess the authority to delegate to his fellow man the complete control of that life-giving principle which was given to him by his creator and belongs to him alone, capital H, him. Are our lives at our own disposal? Have we the right to forfeit that which does not belong to us? 
So they said, so if one person can't give that right to another, then you couldn't make such an arrangement between 10 people or 100 people or 1,000 people or 300,000 people. That is the state of Wisconsin. Therefore, people cannot forfeit this right to their government. Yet under the current system, no one took ultimate responsibility in cases where an innocent person was hanged. In those cases, Bovey argued, jurors, judges, lawmakers, and the people elected them all blame someone else in the system for why it went wrong. And there's no one ultimately responsible for a botched execution that arose from an unfair conviction. And so he wrote, a single individual who would profess to feel the slightest responsibility, and yet there has been an unrighteous act, a grievous wrong committed, and yet is there no one to be found who will say, it is I, it is my responsibility. And still there is a deep and heavy responsibility resting somewhere, and that responsibility can find no other resting place except in the breast of every individual who advocates the death penalty for crime. To Bovey, this was his strongest argument. He argued, therefore, that to support the death penalty was to be personally guilty of murder should any innocent person ever be executed and yet deny any such guilt. That, to him, is what made the death penalty absolutely unsupportable. Um, he also then went on to say that the death penalty tended to be tor um, demoralizing in its tendency, checking the growth of all that is moral in our natures. And he has a lot of such rhetoric about it. Chains the finer sensibilities of man's nature to the groveling passions of life and restrains him from the practice of those pure principles of virtue which are the safeguards of Christian society. Again, that Christian society, it is at the heart of his argument. Believing that the great cause of humanity would be advanced, the moral standard of mankind more highly elevated, and the bonds of Christian brotherhood more closely cemented by the repeal of this law, your committee will report back the accompany bill and recommend passage of the same. That was an argument based deeply in the society in which he lived, a society that had been through the Second Great Awakening, a society, a society that had been deeply and profoundly influenced by that series of revivals and that was open to this message based largely on his reading of Christian doctrine. In response, in July 8th, the Senate passed the bill by a vote of 14 to 9, and the governor signed it into law on July 10th, 1853. To this day, John McCaffrey remains the last person ever executed in Wisconsin. And to my knowledge, no other polity on earth has gone longer without a death penalty. In the United States, it's a state decision. In some other countries, it's a countrywide decision. No other country or state has had the, a death penalty off the books for longer than Wisconsin. So what happened to these men afterwards? They, many of them served in the state legislature for a small time. Um, but in the end, they went their separate ways. Scholes went on to work on his typewriter, his QWERTY keyboard. He continued to be an editor. He continued to work for reforms of prisons and the death penalty and the like. Bo V went on to really continue to be a crusader on this issue. Now that Wisconsin was safe in his mind, he got involved in uh, Michigan and uh, Rhode Island where there were jury choices. They gave the jury a choice not to give the death penalty if there was any doubt. He then went to Illinois, New York, Massachusetts, Minnesota, Pennsylvania, Iowa, and Indiana, arguing those states that they should repeal their death penalty. He returned to Wisconsin whenever anyone suggested that Wisconsin's death penalty be reimposed. He came back in 1857 and 1866 to thwart such attempts. And what's interesting is, in his crusade, he came to correspond with and know many of the great reformers of the day. Abolitionist Garrett Smith, Wendell Phillips, William Lloyd Garrison, Horace Greeley, Longfellow, Charles Sumner, uh, John Greenleaf Whittier, Henry Ward Beecher, Elizabeth Cady Stanton. He's someone who is not known in Wisconsin history now, but who was once very well known. So in closing, let me make one final observation. The conclusion of Bovey's report, written by a Wisconsin farmer in 1853 about the death penalty, made arguments familiar to any student of antebellum reform. 
The same charges against the death penalty were levied regularly against the evils of demon rum, the cruel effect of slave owning on southern whites, the unbridled power of men over women, the costs of ignorance and indolence in a society without free public schools, the dehumanizing toll exacted by barbaric asylums and brutal prisons. Wisconsin's opponents of the death penalty belong to that antebellum reform culture and arguments fit seamlessly into its larger mosaic. And yet, perhaps in a way, the 1853 campaign to abolish the death penalty allows us to see what those reformers so desperately desired above all, that Wisconsin had indeed proved itself to be a full, civilized member of the Union, culturally, prefiguring Wisconsin's decision, decision to support the Union politically and militarily during the Civil War just a few years later. Thank you very much. Thank you.